Thanks for tuning in to The Art of Historical Cookery. I'm Joyce White, a food historian, and I specialize in the foodways of the people who lived in Maryland and the larger Chesapeake region during the 18th and early 19th centuries. Trying to accurately recreate historic recipes certainly has its challenges. First of all, our cooking methods are different, which may yield different results. Secondly, certain ingredients that may once have been very popular may no longer be easy to get because they're just not marketed anymore. And lastly, our foods are produced and processed in different ways today, which can also yield different results. Despite all these challenges though, I'm gonna make every effort to help you try to recreate a taste of the past, which is one of the best links we have to our ancestors. Today's recipe is for Cheshire pork pie. It is taken from Hannah Glass's British cookbook, The Art of Cookery Made Plain and Easy, published in 1747. This cookbook is important because it was exported to the North American colonies and therefore influenced colonial American cookery. Here is the recipe as it appears in the 18th century in Glass's cookbook. Notice that amounts for ingredients are almost non-existent and directions are scant. Fear not, directions for finding my modern recipe adaptation will appear at the end of this program. The name of this pie implies that it's from Cheshire, a county in Northwest England. These pies are characterized by their mixture of savory and sweet ingredients. Fresh pork, apples, and sugar make this the perfect meal to serve on a cool autumn night. So let's get cooking. To start, we're going to make the pastry crust first. In 18th and 19th century British and American pie making, puff pastry and short crust pastry were commonly used. So we're going to need all-purpose flour as well as some white whole wheat or whole grain pastry flour. Pie crusts made with flour from soft varieties of wheat berries are best because they have low amounts of protein, also called gluten. This results in soft and tender baked goods. Most wheat grown in early Maryland was actually a soft, low protein variety. Before mechanization, flour was refined by sifting out its germ and bran by hand, so it was expensive. Because most people likely could not afford to buy fully refined flour, they often sifted out the germ and bran themselves. To recreate historic flour, I like to mix three parts all-purpose white flour with one part whole wheat pastry flour, giving it a bit of the color and flavor of less refined flour. We're also gonna need salt and fat. Primarily, we're gonna use butter, but we're also gonna add an additional fat into this mixture. Um, you could use shredded suet, leaf lard, or if you don't have either of those, you could cheat with some vegetable shortening. Leaf lard from pigs and suet from cows are fats surrounding the kidneys of those animals, and they have higher melting points than butter. Suet has the highest melting point, meaning that it melts much later in the cooking process than leaf lard or butter. Consequently, when suet does finally melt, it leaves behind small air pockets, making the pastry soft and light. In contrast, all butter pastry is just crisp. Therefore, a cook needs to decide which fats to use and in what proportions to use them in to get the desired result. The last thing we're gonna need is just some plain ice cold water. To get started, we're gonna put the flour, the all-purpose flour that is, and the whole grain flour, pastry flour, into the bowl. You'll need two cups all-purpose flour and half cup white whole wheat flour or whole grain pastry flour. And we're just gonna whisk it together. Then we're gonna whisk in the salt. Half teaspoon salt. The next step is going to be to add the butter. You'll need six ounces or one and a half sticks cubed butter. Using your hands, work the cubed butter into the flour until the butter is reduced to the size of small peas and is evenly distributed. 
Add two ounces or a quarter cup of a fat with a high smoke point, such as vegetable shortening, leaf lard, or suet, and rub it into the flour with your hands. Most people today won't be able to source and process suet from scratch, but that's okay because there's a shortcut in the form of Atora, a ready-to-use commercially processed suet made in the United Kingdom that is available online to people outside of the UK. So now we're going to add just enough of the ice cold water just to moisten the ingredients in the bowl, just until they come together. About two to four tablespoons of cold water Stop adding water once your dough starts to come together. And then I like to turn the dough out onto a board and I use my hands to bring it all together into a ball. And then I flatten it into a disc. You really don't wanna to add too much water, so be careful about that. Now this recipe makes enough for one double crusted pie using a pie plate that's about nine inches or so round. The next step is wrapping this in some plastic wrap or parchment paper and putting it in, in the fridge for about 30 minutes. That will allow the dough to, the, to rest and get nice and cool because the colder your dough is, the better the quality will be once it's baked. It'll be nice and flaky. Once the pastry dough has rested, it's then time to line your pie plate with the dough. You'll need to cut off a small amount so that you can make your top crust. So don't forget to, to do that and set it aside until you're ready. As you can see, I've lined my pie plate with the pastry dough and the remaining dough I have wrapped up again and I'm gonna put that back into the fridge so it can stay nice and cold until I'm ready for it. I'm even gonna put the pie plate as is in the fridge to keep it nice and cold until I'm absolutely ready for it. That's just a good rule of thumb to employ anytime you're making a pie. The colder the pie crust, the better the results. Now it's time to make the filling. So we are going to start with a variety of ingredients here. We've got fresh pork loin, about a pound that's been cut up into medallions. We have nutmeg, salt, pepper, apples, whatever kind you have on hand, that's fine, sugar, white wine, and butter. Now it's time to prepare the apples, and I'm gonna have you watch along while I do one of them. Um, I just simply cut it in half, and then cut each half in half. And then for each of these quarters, I just lay it on its side so I can cut the core out. And then I cut the apple quarter into a half again, and then I peel off the skin with my knife and that's it you don't need to make them too small um, you don't want them to fall apart completely or turn into applesauce so i like to keep them a little bit on the larger side um, but you can make these however you like and what we're going to do now is we're going to get all of the rest of our ingredients out and we're going to start layering it's the best way to do we're going to take little bits of the pork and line them on the bottom of the pan, the pie plate. And now we're gonna season. So we're just gonna sprinkle with salt, a little bit of pepper. Season with salt and pepper to taste. And my favorite ingredient, which is nutmeg. Freshly grated nutmeg tastes much fresher than pre-ground and has an almost lemony essence. It's well worth trying if you've never had it. Add nutmeg to taste, but don't overdo it because if too much is used, a bitter taste can develop. We're going to add our layer of apples. And I like a lot of apples in this. So about half your pork and half your apples for each layer. And then we're going to add some sugar and this is just a you know per taste per, per everybody's got their own idea of how much sugar to put in here i like to put a fair amount if my apples are not the sweetest but you, you're just going to have to judge that for yourself depending on how sweet your apples are one half cup of sugar or to taste and then what we're going to do is take some butter and we're going to dot that on the top. 
half a stick or two ounces of butter or more if you like. A little bit more. You can never go wrong with butter. You can never have too much. Okay, so now we're going to do that whole thing all over again. A lot of people tell me they think people in the 1800s didn't eat sugar because it was expensive. And yes, I'm sure there were people who couldn't afford it, but it had uh, dropped in price by a, quite by a lot by that time, unfortunately, because of the sugar plantations that were worked by the enslaved. So uh, by the 1800s, sugar was available in one form or another to most people. Um, and when they could get it, they used it heavily. So they might not have sugar as frequently as we do, but their recipes prove that they really, really did enjoy consuming large quantities of sugar. Um, again, we're gonna top with some more butter. This butter is delicious in this. And it helps to make the, the combine with the juices and make a really, really nice, um, almost like a gravy in here. I like to add a little bit more nutmeg on top of all of this. It just adds a little bit of extra flavor onto the apples. Okay, I've rolled out my top crust and the very final ingredient, the thing that you wanna put in very, very last is the wine. Um, this is just white wine. You can use any kind of wine. I've got this Moscato, which was left over, which is perfect because it's nice and sweet. Um, I'm just going to pour it in last because I don't want the liquid to soften that bottom of the pie crust, that pie dough, and make it soggy. So just put that in at the very last minute before you go ahead and put that top layer on, which I'm going to do right now and be back to you shortly. You'll need about three-fourths of a cup of white wine. So my pie is almost ready to go into the oven. The top is on and I'm just sealing the top shut. At this point, um, if you'd like, you can coat the top of the dough with some egg or egg and milk mixture. I'm not a big fan of that, so I don't do it, but a lot of people like to do that. The other thing you're gonna have to do is poke some holes in here to allow the steam to escape. Historically, melted butter, melted gelatin, wine, or wine-based sauces called caudals were poured into baked pies through holes cut into the centers of their top crusts. If you like, you can make a hole in the top of your crust and add the wine after it is baked and removed from the oven. Place the pie on a large baking sheet lined with parchment paper and bake at 350 degrees for 55 to 60 minutes or until the pastry is golden and the apples are soft when pierced with a knife. Serve Cheshire pork pie warm from the oven. Notice all the sweet and savory layers of pork and apples. This is a perfect fall dish but can be enjoyed any time of the year. Thanks for watching.